this lecture, we want to uh, finish up on discussing some major majuscule manuscripts, and we'll be talking about four of them. The first is Codex Alexandrinus. We've been talking about these in the order of their discovery or their knownness, if you will. We started with Codex Vaticanus, which was known in 1475 when the first library catalog of the Vatican Library was made. Then we talked about Codex Bezae, which is also known as Codex Contrabrigiensis, or Cambridge Codex, that was uh, learned of in 1581 when Theodore Beza gave it to the, the University of Cambridge. And now comes Codex Alexandrinus, which was a gift meant for King James of the King James Bible. And it was given to the crown 16 years after the King James Version was produced. But he didn't give it to King James. It came from Cyril Lucar, Lucar who was the Patriarch of Constantinople, meant for King James, but uh, James died uh, before it could be delivered. And so he ended up giving it to the next king, King Charles, in 1627. This manuscript is remarkable. Had it been known before the King James Bible was published, probably the King James would still be sitting on the throne. It's such a good manuscript that it, was, uh, it would be difficult to dislodge the King James Bible if it had been based on this one to some degree. Its date is a 5th century manuscript. It's a two-column manuscript, and it's interesting. It's Byzantine in the Gospels, but it's Alexandrian for the rest of the New Testament. Typically kind of a secondary Alexandrian, but still pretty important. <clears throat> for the rest of the New Testament. But once you get to the book of Revelation, now it becomes the number one most important manuscript we have for the book of Revelation. Extremely uh, uh, important text for Revelation. So one of these mixed text manuscripts like Codex Washingtonianus that we'll talk about later, uh, Byzantine of the Gospels, Alexandrian for the rest of the New Testament. It originally had the whole New Testament in it, the whole Bible, but we don't have all the rest of that anymore. This is, uh, I'm just going to show you real briefly, the beginning of John in Codex Alexandrinus. And at the beginning of John in the left column, what we actually see here are, are section titles. The right column is actually the text of John. One of the things that's interesting here, and one of the evidences that this is a 5th century manuscript rather than 4th, is you notice the large letters that each verse or section begins with. Uh, it's known as ekthesis, that is, it's a letter that's sitting out in the margin uh, to uh, introduce a, a new section or a verse or division. This is before we actually have verse numbers, but a lot of these manuscripts go in the same direction that our later verse numbers really follow. But it begins, which we don't have in codex, the codices of the fourth century, it begins with chapter sections, or, or at least section titles, known as uh, kephalioi, uh, headings, if you will, and we'll talk about those uh, here on, uh, on, on this slide. Uh, these section titles, each one of them starts with peri, which means concerning, and I'll, I'll just read the four that we have here. We have concerning the five loaves and the two fish, and then the next one, you see in the margin, you've got a couple letters that tell you these letters that we have in the margin here, you'll see in the margin of the actual uh, Gospel of John, and that tells you that's, it matches it up so you'll know where you're at. Uh, concerning the walking on the sea. Well, who walked on the sea? Well, Jesus did, and Peter, but it's concerning the walking on the sea. Then the third one is concerning the blind man. And then the fourth is concerning Lazarus. Now, I want you to notice what's missing here. The story of the woman caught in adultery is not listed here. There's several other things, but that's kind of an important story to, to, to miss. And you start with the five loaves and the two fish, that's John chapter 6. By the time you get to Lazarus, that's John 11. So it's skipping a lot of things. But it's this very fact that uh, uh, caused me some, some puzzle several years ago, where uh, the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts has a manuscript of Luke's Gospel, and at the end of Luke's Gospel, it has these same section headings for John, but that's the end of the manuscript is just Luke, so we don't have the rest of it uh, anywhere. And it also does not list the story of the woman caught in adultery there. 
So I went and I began to look at a number of manuscripts to see their section headings. And I found a number of them that did have a section heading for the story of the woman caught in adultery. And sure enough, they had that passage in there. But I also found, which was a curiosity to me, some of these manuscripts that did not have that section heading, and yet they still had the story of the woman caught in adultery. So what's to, what, what does this tell us? Most likely, once these section headings began to be used in maybe the late 4th century, certainly by the 5th century, that passage was not found in these manuscripts and it was not uh, put in these section headings. Later uh, scribes decided to put that passage in, but they didn't adjust the section headings. Some of them even adjusted the section headings. So what does that tell me about the particular manuscript that uh, the center owns? Absolutely nothing. I can't tell if the story of the woman caught in adultery was in John or not because it can go in either direction. With Alexandrinus, though, it's a little bit different. We're actually missing some material in this manuscript right where the story of the woman caught in adultery should be. But we know how many leaves were missing, we know how many lines per uh, column are in this thing, and we know approximately how many letters per line. So scholars have been able to construct this, and everybody is in agreement. This manuscript, 5th century, did not have the story of the woman caught in adultery. So even those who want that story to be authentic and consider it authentic would say, we know this manuscript, a Byzantine manuscript in the Gospels, did not have the story of the woman caught in adultery. Now that's fascinating, because that's very distinctively a Byzantine reading. The vast majority of Byzantine manuscripts have the story of the woman caught in adultery. But here's perhaps the earliest Byzantine manuscript, if not the earliest, the second earliest Byzantine manuscript we know of, at least for the Gospels, and it doesn't have it. So, uh, fascinating stuff to think about. These are the ways in which these manuscripts are looked at. Uh, and uh, Codex Alexandrinus, one of the more interesting ones. This manuscript is sitting in the British Library, right next to Codex Sinaiticus, in the Ritblatt room, close to uh, first edition of the Beatles' White Album. <laughs> Two of those things are extremely important. I'll f let you figure out which one. Then there's Codex Ephraimi Rescriptus. This is housed at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, and uh, it's not on display. It's an early 5th century manuscript. It's got a mixed text. It's not a pure Alexandrian or Byzantine or Western. It's, it's a mixed text, but it's largely Alexandrian, and it's a palimpsest. This is the most important palimpsest we have for the New Testament manuscripts. There was a scribe, probably in about the 12th century, who scraped the text of this parchment manuscript over and wrote out the sermons of Ephraim the Syrian on top. Not realizing that sermons are not as important as scripture, or maybe he couldn't even read the underlying Greek text. And so what happens with these palimpsests is often what, what, what happens is somebody uh, is writing out his own text. So this is the sermons of Ephraim. He's writing out the text of, of Ephraim. And what he does is he says, gee, we're, we're running short on some leaves. So uh, maybe he's got a lot of these sermons, much more than we have of these extra leaves. And he finds this, this has about 150 leaves uh, in it uh, for the New Testament at least. And he finds these leaves and they're not quite the right size. So he trims them, makes them fit. And sometimes they'll be backwards, upside down, all sorts of things. And so, and they're certainly not in order. He doesn't care about the order of the original text. He cares about the order of what he's doing for his manuscript. So these manuscripts are not in order. Uh, and uh, there's 145 New Testament leaves, 64 Old Testament. It was originally a complete Bible. This is the second best manuscript for Revelation. For other books, not nearly as important. But for Revelation, it is important, and it's considered one of the four great uncials or majuscules, four manuscripts, Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, uh, Alexandrinus, and Ephraimi Rescriptus, or Aleph, A, B, C. Those four manuscripts had the whole Bible in it. The only four manuscripts uh, the, that are written in the 4th or 5th century that did have the whole Bible that, that we have still today. Uh, and only one of those has the complete New Testament still in it. So it was um, difficult to read this manuscript because it was a palimpsest, uh, 
almost impossible to read the undertext. But this fellow by the name of Konstantin Tischendorf deciphered this text in the 1840s. He comes to the Bibliothèque Nationale in 1841, and he's a young man when he's doing this. In fact, he was, uh, I think, 26 years old uh, when he went there. Uh, nobody could read very much of the text. It was next to impossible to, to decipher. Tischendorf spent two years deciphering this text. Two years of his life reading 200 leaves of a manuscript and writing them out. His, his eyesight and his patience were absolutely amazing. He was, as I said, in his 20s. Chemical reagents had been applied to these leaves in the 1830s, and this is interesting. It turned the leaves blue, and so it's got kind of an unusual, kind of a pretty hue to it, but it also severely damaged the manuscript. Tischendorf didn't do it, but somebody before him had done it, and this manuscript is very frail. I know this because in 2011 I uh, examined it. I wanted to see if I could read the other 1% that Tischendorf couldn't read, and as much as my pride was on the line, I, I couldn't read a thing. I mean, uh, th this is, the other, he, he, Tischendorf could decipher 99% of this. The 1% he couldn't decipher was the initial lines of each book of the Bible. Why? Because those lines were written in red letters. And red lettering, depending on when it was done, depending on what kind of ink was used, could either be very faint or very clear even centuries later. This was a manuscript where the red lettering was so faint it couldn't be read. I couldn't make out a single letter of any of these uh, uh, rubricated uh, texts. But I knew at the same time uh, what it was because it's the beginning of the documents and you can tell by how many lines probably how much was there, but we can't really use it for much. Now, it's in extremely fragile shape today, so much so that each leaf, when you hold it up to the light, it looks like a stencil. You can see uh, light coming through it where there's nothing there, there's just air. And it really needs to be digitized with what's called multispectral imaging today. It hasn't been digitized with that. But when I was there in 2011, I suggested that they really need to get this manuscript digitized, at least with something, and they have now done this, the Bibliothèque Nationale has. One of the interesting things about this manuscript is what it reads at Revelation chapter 13, verse 18. I've told you, here's a manuscript that's the second most important manuscript we have for Revelation. Revelation 13, 18 speaks of the number of the beast. Well, we all know what the number of the beast is. It's 666. Not in this manuscript. It's 616. Well, until 1998, it was the only manuscript known to have this reading. In 1998, there were 17 papyri at Oxford University that were worked through and then published. And one of them, our second oldest manuscript for Revelation, and the oldest manuscript we have for that particular verse, also has, for the number of the beast, 616. Uh, I'll talk to you about that textual problem later, but here we have two manuscripts with the number of the beast as 616. I've had the privilege of examining both of them in the flesh. And for the other manuscript, the papyrus, I actually looked at it under a magnifying glass and a microscope to make sure it had not been tampered with, and sure enough, it had not been. Here's a picture of Codex C, or Ephraimia Rescriptus. And you can see this, this text that's handwritten on top, but you can see the undertext pretty clearly here because of these chemical reagents. Actually, the chemicals have made the text over uh, the last 150 years even easier to read, but in the process, it's also deteriorating the manuscript. So we're probably at the height of being able to read what this text says, but it may not last that much longer. We don't know how much longer it'll last. Very, very important manuscript. This gave Tischendorf immediate fame. So he spends two years looking at this manuscript, and then what does he do? He goes off to Egypt to discover more manuscripts. Co uh, Konstantin von Tischendorf is considered to be the greatest New Testament textual critic who ever lived. He died when he was 59 years old. Uh, incredible scholar. My 25th birthday was my de most depressing birthday ever. Uh, and the reason was I was in seminary, and I knew about Tischendorf at the time, and I thought, my gosh, Look at the languages this guy knows. And I don't know that many languages yet. I only knew three. And so he knew like five or something like that. And I haven't been able to keep up by any means. But the guy was absolutely phenomenally brilliant. 
And so after he, he uh, discovers or, or deciphers the text of Codex of Framia Rescriptus, he gets international fame, and then he gets funded by Fredericks of Saxony to go to the Middle East and hunt for other manuscripts. And he goes to Mount Sinai, St. Catherine's Monastery at Mount Sinai. And when he was there, he claimed that the monks were burning the leaves of this manuscript, Codex Sinaiticus. And he made two more visits, uh, 1853 and 1859, and then he saw the New Testament part of it. I'll give a whole lecture on just uh, Tishnorf and Codex Sinaiticus, so I'll just touch on the highlights right now. But let me just mention this. This is the oldest continuously inhabited monastery in the world, built in the middle of the 6th century by Emperor, Emperor Justinian. And you see that uh, circled area, that's the only way you could have access uh, into this monastery, about 25 feet up off the ground, until 1861. So if you're going to try to attack this monastery, good luck, you're going to have to stand in line and get pulled up by a rope into an outhouse, you know. Um, in 1975, you see where the arrow is pointing, in 1975 a geniza was discovered, or a storeroom, that they didn't know existed. What they discovered in that storeroom were 1,200 manuscripts and 50,000 fragments of manuscripts. I'll give a whole lecture about that discovery in Tishnorf and what happened. I visited St. Catherine's Monastery in 2002, and I had the privilege of examining four of the manuscripts that they had discovered in 1975. And in those four, I discovered two more manuscripts. I'll tell a little bit about that later, but that's uh, some on the background for Codex Sinaiticus. Now, uh, the date of the manuscript is 4th century, same date as Vaticanus, maybe a little bit more recent than Vaticanus. It's got the Alexandrian text type. It's the oldest complete New Testament. The, the whole New Testament is still there. Every single leaf of the New Testament is, is found intact in this manuscript. One of the fascinating things about it is what Tischendorf's motive was when he was out searching for these manuscripts. He discovers this, by the way, the Old Testament portion of it, when he's 29 years old. So the rest of his career is downhill. For the next 30 years, you know, it's, it's just not quite as good as what this was. But um, I consider this to be the second most important New Testament manuscript after Vaticanus. And uh, his motivation was due to F.C. Bauer. We've talked about F.C. Bauer when it came to P52. Bauer was this scholar who was trying to apply Hegelian dialectic to the New Testament. And one of the things Bauer said was, we can't possibly tell what the original New Testament said. Why not? We just don't have very many early manuscripts. We got one from the 4th century, one from the 5th that just has the Gospels in it, and then uh, uh, Tishinov uh, deciphers this other one from the 5th, but nobody knew about this manuscript. And so he said, we just don't have early manuscripts that tell us what, what the original te New Testament said. Tischendorf was motivated by evangelical zeal to prove Bauer wrong, to say, we do know what the original New Testament said. So he was driven by his love of Jesus Christ and his love of the gospel and became the world's greatest textual critic because of it. Well, since 1859, when he discovered the New Testament portion, and I'll give you the whole thing on that, uh, it ended up in Russia to start with. It was on display 10 years later at the National Library in St. Petersburg. And now the manuscript is in the British Library. How did it get there from Russia? I'll reserve that for a later lecture. But um, let me mention just one other thing. This is the only manuscript that has a Hebrew letter associated with it. It's manuscript 01. In the order of majuscule manuscripts that would have been discovered, this would have been the manuscript S. That gets buried in the piles. Tischendorf, who was one of these guys who actually kind of came up with a new cataloging system for the manuscripts, came up with Aleph for this manuscript. Why did he do it? Well, he discovered the thing. I think this was his favorite manuscript. And what's he doing by calling it Aleph? The only manuscript we have with a Hebrew letter. What he's essentially doing is saying this. Uh, if you read the, if you look at the yellow pages, you know, some of you have seen yellow pages. Nobody uses that anymore. We all use the internet now. But yellow pages, if you go, gee, I've got some uh, bug infestation in my house. I've got to get rid of these bugs. So you look at, you see, double A, uh, pest control. 
triple a pest control five a pest control you know that way it gets listed first in the yellow pages there's this commercial where this guy it's a car repair it goes a a a a a it goes on forever so he can be the very first one listed that's what tischendorf is doing he wants this to be known as the very first new testament manuscript so he gives it a hebrew letter just like the motive for the yellow pages it's, it's hilarious and yet it's uh, also fascinating he was right this manuscript is extraordinarily important it's the only four-column codex in the world. Here it is. All four columns. This is the end of Mark's Gospel, and then the beginning of Luke next. We'll talk about that in a separate lecture. But you're getting a sense of some of these important manuscripts, some of the important discoveries, some of the important textual problems, and uh, we're going to put some of this together when we talk about various textual problems, and we'll put all of it together in our last two lectures. All right, finally we come to Codex Washingtonianus. This was purchased by Charles Freer, an American, in 1906, and then it became part of the Freer Gallery at the University of Michigan, which later was donated to the Smithsonian Institution and is now part of the Sackler Museum of the Smithsonian Institution, the Freer Gallery. Uh, I have seen this manuscript several times, and every time I've seen it, it's been by appointment because except for one brief period in 2006, this manuscript has never been on display. It's been in the basement of the Freer Gallery of the Sackler Museum of the Smithsonian Institution. So I've had to call ahead of time and say, I'd like to come see Codex W. Every time I come, it's an old friend. We sit down and have coffee together and uh, we'll talk. So uh, I, I, I've seen it many times. Now, it's a manuscript that this is one of the curious things about these manuscripts. Years ago, before there was digital photography, there, was, there were hard copy prints made of this, exactly 435 of them, kind of like the 460 or 450 copies of Codex Vaticanus. Only 435 of these were made, and in the published edition of it, it listed every single library that had a copy. The University of Michigan, because this was Charles Freer's manuscript got two of those copies and the uh, the university gave one of those manuscripts to Grace Theological Seminary which was uh, in that area in Indiana because they knew the librarian he really was a biblical scholar and that scholar Robert Eibach came to Dallas Seminary and brought that manuscript facsimile with him so Dallas Seminary has one of the 435 which CSNTM photographed some years ago and uh, so we, we have that. But before we had a chance to photograph it, before we digitized it, before there was digital photography, I was at the uh, Smithsonian one year and I said, I'd like to buy a microfilm of this manuscript. And they said, oh, well, we don't have any microfilms made up. We'll have to make them up. Really? You don't get requests for this all the time? Well, not really. We've made up five microfilms in the past and they lasted 30 years. Five microfilms of this manuscript lasted 30 years. So they said, we'll make up another five and it'll last a long time. I got one for myself, one for Dallas Seminary, and a friend of mine got one. That's three of them, $25 a piece. It cost nothing. Uh, and I, so three of these five got sold immediately. And I mentioned it to some other uh, New Testament textual critics. And I said, hey, you guys want to get in on this? And they said, nah, not interested. Huh? Anyway, uh, they didn't have the facsimile, the hard copy, like we did at the seminary, but at least now at CSNTM's website, you can see the uh, uh, pretty decent photographs of it. It's a late 4th, early 5th century manuscript, and it's known as Codex W, not for Washingtonianus, that's because it's in uh, Washington, D.C., but because this is the letter that it would have been in the alphabet for Greek manuscripts. Western Order of the Gospels, another one. Matthew, John, Luke, Mark. And it's the most important Gospels manuscript in the United States. Now, what's really interesting about this is that it's a, a patchwork text in Matthew. And Luke 8, 13 through 24, 53, you don't need to remember this stuff. Just remember the general gist of this. It's got a Byzantine text to it. In Mark 1, 1 through 5, 30, it's Western. In my, Mark 5.31, through the end of the gospel, it's Caesarean, but there's a question mark because we're not even sure there is such a thing as a Caesarean text. We just know it's not Byzantine or Western or Alexandrian. It looks different. It looks like some other manuscripts. But then in Luke 1.1 1, 1 through 8.12 and John 5.12 through 21.25, the end of John, it's Alexandrian. 
In the first five chapters of John, it's mixed. What is this manuscript doing? Where does this scribe come off thinking he could just have a patchwork text like this? Well, the original editor, Henry Sanders, argued that this manuscript probably was put together because of the Diocletian persecution, where Diocletian was destroying scripture. And the scribe of Codex W is trying to patchwork these together on the basis of manuscripts that he found. And uh, he couldn't find complete gospels of Matthew or Mark or Luke or John. And so what he did was found the ones that he could in various regions, put them all together, and you have this patchwork jo uh, job that is probably uh, due to those reasons. Now, in recent years, this manuscript has been considered maybe possibly as late as the seventh century. There was a, a scholar in Germany who argued this. But one of my students, a fellow by the name of Zachary Cole, wrote his master's thesis on uh, numbers in early manuscripts, and this is something that he's hoping to get published. He didn't realize that this manuscript was a patchwork gospels manuscript. And what he did was, I, I've talked to you before about how these scribes, uh, not professional scribes, would uh, use the abbreviations for numbers with a horizontal bar above it to indicate that. That was the, the, the bureaucrats and the bean counters that did that, but not literary scribes. And so what Zach was doing was he was going through to see in all the manuscripts through the first five centuries which ones had these number abbreviations and which ones didn't. And when he came to Codex W, he contacted me and said, Dr. Wallace, this is bizarre. It's got abbreviations in this section, but not this section. And then again in this section and not this section. And he went through and talked about, and in this section it's got a lot. Here it's got a few. It matched exactly what Henry Sanders pointed out about the patchwork nature of this thing. What did that tell us? It told us that the scribe of Codex W was a very faithful transcriber of the manuscripts that he had put together, even to the point of using number abbreviations in some place and writing out fully in other places. That's, that's huge. I mean, this is, this is a manuscript from the late 4th, early 5th century, but it goes back to an earlier tradition, probably early 4th century. And we can tell that because the scribe is faithful, even in how he represents numbers, even if it's not the way he would do it himself. So it's, it's fascinating to see this kind of stuff. Uh, I'm hoping to see uh, Zach's uh, thesis get published. He just got accepted at U University of Edinburgh for doctoral studies in textual criticism, by the way. Okay, now the most famous thing about this manuscript is what's known as the Freer Logion, or the saying of Jesus found between Mark chapter 16, verses 14 and 15. Jerome knew about these words, but he had not seen, or he'd seen some manuscripts that have it, but until this manuscript was discovered, we knew of no manuscript that had what we now call the freer logion. It's to this day the only manuscript that we know of that had it, even though Jerome talks about others. And here's what you have. This is the famous passage where the disciples see Jesus, and uh, he tells them if you pick up snakes and get bit, you won't die, and you can drink poison, this kind of thing. But before he says that, uh, he's rebuking them, and here we have between verses 14 and 15, only in this manuscript, and I'll show you a page of this in just a second. And they excuse themselves, saying, this age of lawlessness and unbelief is under, under Satan. Now just listen to this to see if it sounds like the way the disciples would talk to Jesus, especially post-resurrection. And the, the, it just, it's, it's just it, it's funny. This age of lawlessness and unbelief is under Satan, who does not allow the truth and power of God to prevail over the unclean things of the spirits. Really, Satan has power over God. That's, that's good to know. Therefore, reveal thy righteousness now. Thus they spoke to Christ. And Christ replied to them, The term of years of Satan's power has been fulfilled, but other terrible things draw near. And for those who have sinned, I was delivered over to death, that they may inherit the spiritual an incorruptible glory of righteousness which is in heaven. This is Bruce Metzger's translation of it. That's a mouthful. Does this sound like anything you've read in the New Testament? It's way too flowery. Here's the text in Greek. So you can just read along with me as you see it. And you can see a, a third or a second line from the bottom, this scribe took a cigarette break in the middle of working on this and accidentally burned a, burned a hole in the manuscript. But here you have this freer logion. It's another part of an, uh, one of these endings to the Gospel of Mark, we actually have five different ways in which Mark's Gospel ends in the, in the manuscripts. And this is included in, in one of those. So, uh, fascinating manuscript, interesting history, early, 
in many places very important, other places not so important, but it's the most important Gospels manuscript in America. The greatest stories, the greatest events, the greatest people, the personalities, struggles, bad guys, good guys, all kinds of stuff are filled in our heritage. But most importantly, our heritage is about finding God. Because we believe that we, as Tim prayed earlier, are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We believe that there have been many people before us that have been indwelt by the same Holy Spirit. And that we have a connection, a spiritual DNA, if you will, that we go back and we find that, and we find inspiration, we find hope, and we find the challenges that they've gone through. And we don't have to relive things and, and, and the mistakes of the past. Yeah.